Welcome, family, to the DJP. I am your host, Justin Otto, and I will act as your Sherpa through the many varied landscapes that are the topics of this podcast. All right, so get this. If you listen to this show at all, you probably know that I'm in recovery, and I'm a member of a few different recovery-focused organizations. Anyway, I recently volunteered to help bring uh, one of these programs to the correctional system where I live, as the facilities here, they haven't really offered in-person meetings at the jail or any meetings since early 2020. I mean, you know, for obvious reasons, which I'm not going to go into. But anyway, so I had to get a background check in order to be able to volunteer there. And guess what? I didn't pass it. Nope. Didn't make the cut. So my question is, who do they think leads these meetings? I mean, come on. It's people like me. It's people with check or pass that can't pass a background check. I mean, isn't the whole point of what we're trying to do here is like to deliver a message of hope to those seeking recovery? I mean, I've been arrested a litany of times, trust me, but I don't have any like weird shit on my record, you know, like no violent charges or nothing seedy. Drug and alcohol offenses are what my entire rap sheet is comprised of. So you would think that since I've managed to kick drugs and alcohol and get my life half-assed together, at least that I would be the perfect person to say, Hey, guess what? I've been where you are and it is possible to turn your life around and to live a fulfilling and meaningful life, even after drug convictions and DUIs and all the bullshit that addiction is comprised of and is possible. But just don't try to get that message to the people that actually need it, because no matter how much you're able to turn your life around, the government and closed minded people will always judge you by who you were and not who you are. And you know what? I'm willing to bet that my guest on this episode, Mr. John Giordano, probably experienced at least a little bit of the same thing that I'm going through now. But since then, since growing up the son of a heroin dealer, and since experiencing a massive amount of trauma as a child, and since falling into drugs and alcohol, he's gotten his life together. And he's had it together for over 35 years now. And in that time, he's become an expert in the treatment of addiction, mental health, and he's also the founder of the National Institute for Holistic Addiction Studies. He's the author of several books, some of which are The Proven Holistic Treatment for Addiction and Chronic Relapse, How to Beat Your Addictions and Live a Quality Life, and his most recent book is the acclaimed The Kid from the South Bronx Who Never Gave Up. And when you hear his story, you'll see where the title of that book came from. He's also the founder of of the prestigious G&G Holistic Addiction Treatment Center in North Miami Beach, Florida. And man, just everything he's done for it, he has done so much to help suffering addicts and hungry ghosts. And we had a really awesome conversation. He's a super cool dude. I really love this. This has been one of my favorite ones that I've done yet. So enjoy. Without further ado, John Giordano. Might catch yourself sliding in and out of my catch yourself sliding in and out of a little room. Just relax and enjoy. Just relax and enjoy. This is an experiment in mind formation. In formation. Forming, forming, controlling, controlling, operating your, operating mind, your mind and your brain. We're using digital, We're using techniques, digital techniques to overload, to overload and scramble, and scramble, confuse, confuse, unfocus, unfocus mind, your mind. natural state of the brain is chaos. Chaos, chaos is beautiful. Is beautiful. John Giordano, how are you doing, man? Doing well. Good, glad to hear it, glad to hear it. So, I'd like to start by just getting a little bit of background about you and exactly what it is that you do and how you came to do what you do. Uh, how long do we have? <laughs> as long as you want. Okay. All right. Um, let me see. All right. When I was a kid, when I was eight, all right, my father went. To, my father was a heroin uh, a heroin dealer. Hmm. Uh, my uncles were hitmen. My uncle was a hitman. My other uncles and cousins were into different kinds of things. We're kind of like a mafia family. Uh, I, I quit school when I was in the ninth grade. And um, when my father went to jail at eight and a half, I got molested. And I carried that with me for a while. And I went to a priest and asked him, maybe it's me. And he says, well, just do a 10 hour fathers and five Hail Marys and you'll be fine. I said, okay, yeah, but that didn't work too well. <laughs> I call myself a recovering Catholic, by the way. <laughs> Anyway, so as time went on, I was in gangs. I was uh, 
all over the place. And then I found karate and I wind up going to karate, uh, learning karate. And, um, you know, when I was in a gang, you know, we seen a karate school and my friend and I says, hey, man, I wonder if we can uh, beat up the karate teachers, see how tough he is. I don't suggest that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we went upstairs and um, it was getting late and the class was still going. I had to be home because otherwise uh, my father, who got out of jail, uh, would hit me with the belt. So we went, and then I told him I wanted to do karate, and he says, oh, okay, my mother said no, my father said yes. Anyway, I got into, into went up to the school, joined, because she had to be 15 at the time. Yeah. It's not like today. And um, it was jujitsu class, but I didn't know the difference. I didn't really care. All I wanted to do was punch the, the teacher in the face, because I thought I was a tough kid from the South Bronx, you know. I was a tough fool from the South Bronx, but I didn't know that at the time. But anyway, the teacher had us all in a, after we did some rolls and and falls and stuff, he had us in a circle and he said, uh, I need a volunteer. So I said, yeah, I raised my hand. I said, okay. So he was teaching how to block a punch. Hmm. As he was talking to the class, I tried to sneak punch him. I don't do that, by the way. All I know is I winded up on the floor with a foot in my throat. And a big round face looking down at me and smiling at me. Hmm. Well, I fell in love with the martial arts. And I was doing it seven days a week. I, I, I we got a black belt in judo. I got a black belt in jiu-jitsu. I, I became a Chipotle judo champion. Oh, wow. Um, then I went to karate and uh, I, I had a, I couldn't do all the, the martial arts at the same time. So I just stayed with karate. And um, eventually, you know, I became a national karate champion and um, and I'm in the Black Belt Hall of Fame, a five-time national karate champion, all that kind of stuff. Oh, wow, that's awesome. And um, so what happened was, is that uh, I was 20, I met this girl and uh, I never used drugs. You know, my students I had at the Carillon Hotel in Miami Beach and they used to come in my class high. I said, oh, you want it? Oh, oh that's good. Uh, I made them throw up. I mean, exercise was so much. I figured that would deter them. They came in the next day high again. So I says, oh, okay. All right. So I did it again to them. And then one of them says to me, hey, sensei, sensei, he's teaching. He said, well, you know, why don't you try it? I said, I don't need that shit. So anyway, I went home and uh, I had a neighbor that came in. And he had this little vial he was showing me with clear liquid in it. And I said, what's that? He said, no, that's, that's LSD, man. That's like pure LSD. I said, oh, let me see it. And I took it, un- turned off the cap, and then drank the whole thing. Oh, Jesus. Well, I didn't know that it was five. <laughs> it wound up being five hits. All right? So I was in space for like three days. I almost killed a guy when they gave me it. All right? Uh, well, actually, he didn't give it to me, showed me it, and I took it. And I thought he looked like a frog. I don't know why he said that, but you know, I, I said, I think I'm going to kill you. So he said, oh, look at the chandelier. And I looked at the chandelier, and, and then he distracted me, and I went on to a different journey. So I started to do uh, uh, psychedelics for, you know, on the weekend, and then sometimes during the week, and, right. and all this kind of stuff. Then I went from there with the pot. And uh, I didn't like the pot too much because I was I was eating like uh, crazy, and uh, I didn't like the way I was feel like space out all the time. Right. So I gave up the pot. Then I tried opiates. I didn't like that. I got sick. And I said, "No, nah, I don't want this stuff." And then uh, eventually, I you know did pills, and uh, at the time they were quaaludes and uh, and um, two and all, second alls, and hmm. white crosses. Those are like amphetamines. And um, then eventually I went to cocaine, and that's what kind of eventually took me down. Mm-hmm. But meanwhile, what I was doing was I was really, um, I'm surprised I'm not dead, actually. I was doing collection work for the smugglers, and uh, I had you know, a bunch of my black belts. We would do collection work for people who didn't want to pay their bill. Mm-hmm. Uh, then, um, you know, I, I just was, everything was, I was teaching the police department, self-defense, and come along holes. I was teaching the DEA. I mean, and meanwhile, I was using drugs and doing collection work for the smugglers. Uh, then I started dealing drugs. I was doing kilos of cocaine. I was making like about 15, 20,000 a week. So I was doing that. 
And then eventually, you know, it caught up to me as always does. And my family did an intervention on me, intervention. <clears throat> but let me digress a little bit. My uncle, when I was 20, threw my wedding. No. And what had happened was the caterer insulted him in front of the family. Mm. Well, the next morning they found the caterer dead. So we had to leave real quick. My bride, my new bride and I go back to Florida. Uh, he wound up getting arrested and they, it was a whole thing with him. And they put him in a straight jack. He was like crazy. He dove down a flight of stairs. They put him in a mental institution. They, they finally put him in the court and they couldn't prove anything. And he's done. <clears throat> so that's part of my family. And this is the family that's doing an intervention on me. Hmm. I said, who's doing an intervention on them? <laughs> you know, my brother was dealing drugs. Everybody was into nefarious different things that they were doing. Right. So I went into treatment. Now, I didn't want to go treatment. I didn't have a problem. Everybody else had the problem, not me. No, of course. And uh, sure. eventually, I remember when I first went in, they told me, they says, uh, you have to share in group your secrets. I said, if I do that, I have to kill you. So they looked at me and said, what? I said, well, I ain't telling you shit. I don't even know who you are. Right. You know? So anyway, but after a while, it started to, I started to talk. and I started to share a little bit. And uh, I remember uh, it was Christmas Eve. I just turned 37 years of recovery, December 4th. Oh, awesome. Crack. I didn't think I would have 37 minutes. <laughs> I don't learn 37 years. Right. So um, here I am. And I wanted to go home for Christmas Eve, hmm. and they wouldn't let me. <clears throat> so I don't know about you, but I didn't just get angry. I got rageful. Right. And I'm punching the door, and I'm pissed off, kicking it. Um, I never unpacked my luggage. I always had it packed because I was always leaving, you know. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I remember the therapist telling me, hey, John, do you ever get down on your knees and pray? I said, listen, man, I'm a recovering Catholic. That's all we did. I got calluses on my <laughs> so I says, well, why do I have to get down on my knees? What does that mean? So he says, how about humility? I said, oh, you mean God don't, how about if I'm in the closet? You think he listens to me, you know? So, but anyway, he gnawed at my head inside my brain there. And I went to get my, I was really in a lot of pain. Hmm. And, and the only reason I said, I wanted to see my children. I didn't want to see my children. I was, my friends would give me uh, Christmas cards with Coke in it. So that's the, that's the reason I want to go. Anyway, because I was, you know, I, had, I was craving for drugs. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I went to get my knee down. And this may sound a little strange to you in the audience. I couldn't get my knee down. And I said, well, this is ridiculous. Mm. So I pushed my knee down. Then I had to push my other knee down. I think for the first time in my life, I said, look, I don't know what it is out there. God, energy, or spirituality. Mm. He said, can you take this away from me? I'll do whatever you think I should do. Not, never mind what I want to do. Well, let me tell you something. My rage left like it never was there. And I'm going to tell you, that shit never happened to me. It was gone. So how sick I was, I tried to get it back. It come back. So that was my first spiritual awakening in treatment. Things started to change after that. I started to slowly build up a belief system again. Because, you know, as you know, doing drugs and alcohol, okay, you lose your belief system in yourself. So therefore you don't believe anybody else. Yeah. And nobody else is going to help you if you can't help yourself. Absolutely. You know, and that's the attitude we have. And um, we don't, li we, we hear people what they say, but we don't listen. Hearing is biological. Listening is a skill. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So uh, then I remember just before you uh, go to, they go to have you leave treatment. They, they do something called exiting. Yeah, the exit and exiting is where the therapist and the nurses and the doctors all get you in a room. <clears throat> and they talk to you. And the doctor says, oh, John, you're doing great. We're really proud of you. You know, and the, and the nurses and everybody said. And the main doctor, this woman, Dr. Dolores Morgan was her name. She said, he's full of shit. Just like that. Well, the old John came out of the box. <laughs> all right. Yeah. I turned around and called her a fat bitch. All right. I looked right. at everybody in the room and said, 
I can, listen, I can kill all of you and you'll never make it out of the room. All right? So the doctor says to me, John, all we want to do is help you. Well, let me tell you, that hit me like a bullet in the forehead. Mm. I started hysterical crying. I ran out of the room. It was like I was inside my shoes running out. That's how small I felt. And that was the second time that I got a rude awakening. And then here I am. And what happened was I wanted to be a therapist. And they, they said, no, go to aftercare. I stayed in aftercare for about a, about a year and a half. They had to kick me out. I went to therapy. I did everything they told me to do. Right. right? Even, I didn't even believe in it. I didn't like the meetings. I thought the meetings were bullshit. I thought it was another way to get connections. I didn't want to join a new religion. Okay. I didn't like the old one, but I kept going anyway. You know, and I used to say to them, Hey man, when is this going to get better? They said, did you use today? I said, no, John, it already got better. And I went, okay, I'll go for that. Then I wind up getting divorced. They said, don't make any major decisions for at least a year. So it was about nine months and I got, it's like, I can't deal with the She's using and, you know, I didn't want to leave because of the kids. That was my excuse. Right. Okay. And the bottom line is I said, I, I can't do it anymore. The therapist says, yeah, this is not a healthy environment for you. Mm. Okay. So I gave her the car. I gave her the house. I gave her everything. And a friend of mine owned the hotel called the Tudor Hotel, which later on became a famous pre-quarterway house, uh, gave me a room. I had two beds. I had a little uh, warmer that I cooked my food on and had a bicycle that somebody loaned me. Mm. And here I am, homeless, with nothing, just a room now. Yeah. And most people don't even have that. Yeah, for sure. So my kids used to come. They used to cry. We all used to cry together. What are you, daddy? What are you doing here? Mm. And I didn't even know what to tell them. You know, I'm here because this is where I'm supposed to be. Mm. So my journey went on like that. And then eventually I had an, I, you know, I was feeling depressed. I was beating myself up. I felt down. There's supposed to be this karate guy that everybody respects. Hmm. And here I am living like shit. And uh, then uh, HIV came around. I said, oh, great. Now I'll die of AIDS. I said, because I didn't like wearing raincoats, you know. Uh, and then I kept going on and on and on. And then finally I said to myself, you know, I got to change my attitude. This sucks. Okay. So what I started to do is I started to ride my bike a lot. I was riding on the boardwalk down in Miami Beach, looking at the stars or looking at the ocean. Hmm. Started to work out more. Okay. Um, and, and I started to change and I went to more meetings, even though I didn't like them. And I remember a guy came up to me an old time and said to me, Hey, John, uh, you know, you have a, a higher power. I said, listen, I don't want to, that bullshit. He says, no, 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 no. He says, how about God? God? I said, no, no. No, no. G-O-D. I said, look, man, I know how to spell. He said, no, no. Good orderly direction. How's that? Mm -hmm. I said, well, I can deal with that. That was my higher power for about a year and a half. So I was a very angry guy. I, I, uh, I had all this shame and all this guilt and all this anger mm -hmm. about what I did to myself and what I did to my family. You know, I started to realize when, you know, when you clear up and you're talking to people and you realize that, man, it's not just about us. We're hurting everybody that loves us. Yeah. But we don't really give a shit because we're so wrapped up in us. So uh, I, the guy didn't own the, the hotel. I talked him into opening up a three-quarter house in there. Hmm. It was an ALF. Uh, ALF was an adult congregate living facility as for elderly people. Right. They placed them in different places and they opened up a three-quarter house. That went real well. Then uh, I came up with another idea to open up a treatment center. Now, the only thing I knew about treatment that I was in one. <laughs> but if I know about treatment centers. Okay. It's a good, it's a good business plan. Huh? I said that's a good business plan. Yeah, right. Oh, <laughs> I had a great business plan. So he says to me, my friend, how much do you need? Okay, at first I told him, I got this famous doctor. It was a doctor that treated me. Everybody knew and everybody loved. He was in recovery. And mm. I said, I got this guy. And he says, if you have him, I'll give you the money. But how much do you need? 
Now, what do I know how much I need? I don't know shit. Right. I said, a quarter of a million dollars. He said, well, you got it. So I went to the doctor in, in, the, in Mount Sinai Hospital, and he was always a comedian, so I walked in the room. And he said, hey, John, how you doing? I said, good. Hey, I said, I got a quarter of a million dollars. Would you like to open up your own treatment center? So he started to laugh. He said, you know, I was just thinking about that, which, you know, he was just making a joke. And we wind up opening up my first treatment center, hmm. which was called New Life. Right on. And I hired all of the people that, a lot of the people from Mount Sinai, I didn't know it was the right to take people out of the <laughs> places. <laughs> you know, these are the Oops. people that helped save my life. What better people to have work for right. you? Those are the people you want. Right? Yeah. So the guy that was my therapist, he was making 29000 a year as the program director. Mm. I gave him 50 because he helped me save my life, right? Long story short, uh, we were packed. Okay, in no time. We had a hospital-based problem. I never forget it. I was standing in the wing of a hospital and that we negotiated. And I'm looking around, I'm saying, I was like 15 months clean. I 16 months clean. I says, hmm. I can't believe my life. They said beyond your wildest dreams, they said, but this is ridiculous. You know, here I am. I'm, I got a program. What do I know? I went to the ninth grade. I don't know shit. <laughs> But, you know, I'm a, I'm a New York kid. You know, you know how to hustle and you know how to do your thing, you know? Right. So, uh, anyway, we put the program together. We marketed it. We were packed. And uh, one day they came up. They said we couldn't make payroll. And I said, what? What do you mean we can't make payroll? We're, we're packed. We, 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 can't, we don't have any more beds. Okay? Mm. So, it was a 30-bed uh, detox and inpatient facility and 12 bed psychiatric. Hmm. So they said, no, your friend that put the money up was stealing. I said, wait a second. He doesn't even have the checkbook. He doesn't get, how is he stealing? That's bullshit. Right. So what, what, what wind up happening, my, the guy that was my therapist didn't like the fact that I was his uh, client and now I was his boss, hmm. you know, but who bossed them around? I wasn't bossing anybody around. I was just so happy to be there, you know? And I went and my friend said, the doctor's stealing. I said, never. He's in recovery. You know, I got sober to get stupid, you know? I'm a street kid. We don't believe, we don't trust anybody. Here I am trusting everybody. Okay. So anyway, I went to the doctor's office and says, are you stealing? So he put his head down. He says, yeah, I have a sex addiction. And I've been buying hookers and I bought them apartments. And oh, wow. All so, all right. Well, it was only three years clean. I, I didn't understand what three years clean meant. Right. You know, for those people that are in recovery, you've got to understand something. Just because you stop drugs and alcohol doesn't mean you stop all these behaviors that you acquired. Absolutely. You know, and, and the bottom line is, is that, you know, there's a saying that we have takes – five years to figure out that you got your head up your ass. It takes another five years to get your head out of your ass. And then another five years to figure out now that your head is out of your ass, what are you going to do with your life? <laughs> <laughs> so that's just that's a little true. comical routine. Okay. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and another one is, I, I always like these. Another one is, is uh, how do you, what's the difference between an alcoholic and an addict? I said, well, I'll tell you. I said, if an alcoholic gets drunk and steals your stuff, the next morning he'll sober up and give you back your stuff, most likely. Now, if an addict steals your stuff, the next morning he'll help you look for your stuff. Right. <laughs> that's that's accurate. That is far too accurate. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, you know. So, anyway, uh, long story short, uh, they, the, the, the guy took my... I didn't have a lawyer. I didn't know shit about lawyers. Hmm. What I did while I was working there, I went and got my GED. Um, and I went to school to learn how to be a counselor meanwhile and all this stuff. And, and then this happened. Now, I needed 6,000 hours to get my certification. Hmm. So where am I going to go? So they took the, the treatment center out from under me. And I made me sign papers and stuff. Right. Uh, and they said, look, if you don't sign over, we'll just open another corporation and uh, you'll have nothing. So I said, okay. So I was, I can't even tell you how crazy I got. 
Okay. <laughs> so here I am now in recovery. Huh. All right. So you're in recovery. You're not supposed to do the old things. He goes, I used to do, you know, I used to do collection work. You know, you mess with me, he hits you in the face. Yeah, yeah. You know? Uh, so after we left the lawyer's office, I made a phone call to my relative. Mm. And I told him what happened. He says, I'll be right down. I'll fly right down. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. And I knew what that meant. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So the last minute, I changed my mind. I said, no, because he wound up killing them. And then I wound up probably going to jail with them. So, you know, and I don't want to kill anybody anyway. Right. So they let me stay there. Uh, I stayed there for almost six years. And uh, then eventually I left. Uh, actually, I, I threatened them. You know, I had enough. I had my certification and everything. And I went into this guy's office and I said, listen, man, if you don't give me a contract, because they were supposed to give me a contract, they never gave it to me. I said, if you don't give me my contract, I'm going to rearrange your face. <laughs> and no doctor is going to help you. So that was number one. And number two, I says, I'm calling up my relative who's going to come down and probably blow out your knees. And they knew who he was because he got hooked on crack and we had him in treatment. And I told them what he did for a living, but nobody believed me until one day he's in group. They come running at the therapist, comes running in my office. He goes, your uncle was telling everybody how many people he killed. <laughs> I told you what he did for a living. I said, what do you think? I'm, what, why am I going to bullshit? Right. So, you know, so he knew who he was. Yeah. So I got my contract within two hours, you know, and eventually in about a, I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks later, I left. I wound up getting $80,000. They made millions. So it's okay. Then uh, I wind up, my friend who gave me the money the first time said to me, I got another guy who wants to open up a treatment center. Hmm. He says, you got to get, you got to give him a business plan. Now, listen, man. I don't know nothing about business plans. I says, well, okay. But while I was there for six years, I learned everything about that business. I was in every department. I learned everything about it. Hmm. So what wound up happening was, is that he helped me put together a business plan. I went to meet this guy in West Palm Beach. Two minutes before I went to meet him, I forgot the business plan home. Oh, oh, now, what do I do? I can't go home. I got to go there. And what am I going to say? I look like an idiot. But I choose to look like an idiot. So I says, look, I left the business plan home. He says, don't worry. Here's a napkin. Tell me what, what it's going to, what you're going to do. So I put it down on the napkin. What we needed, what we're going to do, and how much we needed. A year later, I didn't know this guy was a corporate raider. I put the whole program together. We were packed. Everything went great. And then he fired me. I wanted to throw him through a window. He said, you can't <laughs> fire me. I'm your partner. He said, read your contract. Ah, shit. Well, I, I was stupid again. I didn't have a lawyer. All right? Yeah. So all this is in my book, by the way. I wrote my book, My Life Story. Oh, right on. Anyway, I, uh, I worked in, a, in an internship program hmm. for almost a year. But that was ridiculous. It was called a, a, a TC, Therapeutic Community. And it was for homeless people that had HIV and had psychiatric and drug problems. And what they used to do is used to feed them uh, cakes and chocolates and stuff like that at lunchtime because all our food was donated. And about a half hour, 40 minutes, five minutes later, they would all start acting out, just like kids would, you know? So I tell people, I tell the therapist, would you give your kid chocolate and candy? And he said, no, 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 because then they start getting crazy on you. So anyway, I uh, talked to the clients and I said to them, look, this is why you shouldn't eat all this kind of stuff. Let's do a test run, see how you feel afterwards. Hmm. And it worked out great, except I didn't tell the therapist or the program director. Hmm. They got crazy on me. <laughs> they stayed to get their desserts. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, after a year I left, uh, you know, they used to uh, take these guys, put them on a bench and put a sign around their neck. You know, saying that uh, you know, they're supposed to do this and that. I mean, it was crazy. So I wind up leaving. And then I had, uh, I kind of like had a spending addiction. So whatever money I made, I spent. Hmm. And um, I had about $300 left. And a girl I was with said to me, why don't you open up your own program? I said, listen, man, I don't want to open up any programs. <laughs> Just forget about that. I'm doing my karate. 
I'm, you know, I'm just going to, to do clients here and there. Yeah. So eventually, she said, I said, I only got three hundred dollars. Where do I? Well, how am I going to open up anything? So I went to my buddy who owned the place next door to his practice. Yeah. He was a chiropractor and also another karate guy. And I said, Well, how much do you want for that building next door? It was about seven hundred and fifty square feet. Yeah. He said, How much you got? I says, <laughs> I said, I got three hundred dollars in the bank. He says, okay, $300. He says, start it in about three months. When you get started, then you can start paying me. I said, oh, okay. So I opened up. I had an outpatient clinic. I opened I got all the licenses because I learned how to do all that stuff. And I got one of my friends who was work with me in this uh, indigent place, uh, this government uh, treatment center. Yeah. And he was a business guy. I really was in business. The clients used to give me money. It's just put it in my pocket. And I, they said, well, where's your books? I said, what books? He said, no, they'll pay me. Don't worry. He started to laugh. He said, nobody's paying you. So he took over the money. Then we got his son. I'm going to fast forward real quick. And eventually, starting a business with $300 in 2012, hmm. about 18 years later, we sold it for $45 million. Wow. We had seven buildings and 147 employees. My other partner was a genius with the internet. Huh. He used to get a thousand calls a day. Jeez. He used to sell our calls to other treatment centers mm. for a quarter of a million dollars a month. Wow. Now, in the beginning, okay, we couldn't even make payroll. We had our bills coming, we had creditors chasing us. Mm. Uh, and, but eventually it changed. We just never gave up. Yeah. And we even gave scholarships to people when we didn't have any money either. We didn't even get paid. Yeah. So I wrote the book about my life story, how you turn $300 into $45 million, mm. and how you never gave up. This is the book. It's called The Kid from the South Bronx Who Never Gave Up. So it tells about all the things that happened to me in life. Awesome. Man, I have to check that out because you got a fascinating story. Yeah, it's crazy, man. You know, yeah. and I tell people, I say, listen, I don't make this shit up because <laughs> it's too stupid to make up. Right. Like real, real life is oftentimes crazier than anything you can actually write, you know? And well, yeah. that's what I'm getting from your story. That's some crazy shit, man. <laughs> well, you know, I, I know a lot of other stuff. I, I mean, I didn't even tell you. Oh, after. yeah, I'm sure. So, you know, and um, I did a lot of things. I learned a lot of stuff. Hmm. Uh, my son almost died from this disease. Hmm. And that's when I dedicated my life. Uh, I don't know about anybody else, but, you know, I always wanted a son. And here I got a son. And I'm watching him lay in a hospital bed and then feeding charcoal down his throat, trying to absorb the pills that he he swallowed. Yeah. So today, thank God, he's 18 years clean. He's doing great. He's kind of, if I had to design a son, I would have, I would have shortchanged myself. That's how, <laughs> how good he is. That's awesome, man. You know, and he followed that. You know, he did selling drugs, got arrested, all kinds of stuff. That's all in there. Oh, yeah. Same with my daughter, all of them. You know, and... Uh, and then I started to, here's the kid that only went to the ninth grade and got a GED and then got my certifications. Um, now today, I, I, I lecture all over the world. I actually lecture to scientists, researchers, and clinicians. Um, I write books. Uh, if you would have told me this early on in recovery, I probably would have punched you in the face to you're trying to make fun of me. Uh, and uh, I'm with... Uh, Actually, 20 for scientists and researchers from 25 universities. I'm part of their science team. I have currently now, I think it's 77. I'm in 77 medical and scientific peer reviewed journals. Oh, wow. Now, most doctors don't even have one. And I mean, my life has been an incredible journey okay. and it's still going. And um, now I'm working on see if I can make a movie with this book because uh, it's got so many layers to it. Right. And um, matter of fact, I have Captain Sandy from Below Deck. I don't know if you ever watched that. Uh, it's a famous television show. She's interested in helping me. And oh, that's cool. I got a couple other people that I know. and We'll see. I'm trying to get the book out there. It's not about the money stuff. It's, it's, it's about showing people that, look, man, there are no failures in life. All right. There's only lessons. Right. It's what you do with those lessons that makes the difference in your life. You want to feel sorry for yourself? Go ahead. Have yeah. fun. 
Yeah. Okay. And if you say, well, you don't know my life. Look at the shit that's happening to me. Oh my God, this is it. I said, let me tell you something, man. If stuff ain't going on in your life, that means you're dead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Stuff goes on in everybody's life. So what I did with my treatment center that made it, they still talk about it, by the way, um, different than any treatment center. All right. Hmm. I did all alternative medicine that was evidence-based. We did hyperbaric uh, oxygen. Hmm. That's hyperbaric chambers. There's oxygen under pressure where they go right. down for the bends. And then they found out that it heals wounds. They also found out that it works with traumatic brain injury cases in the brain. And look, if you're doing drugs, don't drugs damage your brain? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Apparently. <laughs> so uh, hyperbarics helps to heal that. Oh, that's cool. That's uh, we did acupuncture, neurofeedback, biofeedback, aromatherapy. We did massage therapy, not to be fancy, but to get lymphatic, mas lymphatic massage, to get the drugs out on a cellular level hmm. through massage. So saunas. We took them to the gym. They worked out. We taught them karate. Uh, we have aftercare for life as long as we were alive and they were alive. They had aftercare. Which, well, that meant they come once a week to group or on Skype. That's what we did. Uh, we also did uh, uh, amino, <clears throat> amino acid therapy mm. to help build up your, 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 your uh, neurotransmission in your brain. We did uh, your gut, which is really important. Most people don't know that your gut or your microbiome, microbiota, or the flora in your gut, 90% of dopamine and serotonin is manufactured in your gut. It goes up the vagus nerve into your brain and deposits it. Now, Dr. Blum, who I work with, hmm. <coughs> excuse me, is the geneticist who found the addiction gene. There is an addiction gene. How about that? Huh. It's the main gene, and it's called the DRD2 ALE1 variant gene. And there's other genes connected to it, but this is the main gene. Hmm. So he developed the formulation, an amino acid formulation, that helps to upregulate dopamine. That's the feel-good drug that we look for right. with doing drugs. So we used to give them amino acids. We also did. We also uh, checked them for heavy metals, um, mercury, poison, lead, antinomy, all these different things right. that people have. Okay, because our environment, because of our food supply, our water supply, and. Um, we chelate them out, and we help them that way, too. We looked at allergies. Allergies can also cause depression. Most people don't know that. Mm. Certain allergies. People don't know this also. People get depressed. Right? They think it's only what's going on around them. No. You can have a low thyroid. causes depression and anxiety. You can have leaky gut syndrome or H. pylori infection in the gut. causes depression and anxiety. Now, I always tell people, don't believe anything I tell you. Please. Go look it up for yourself. Right. It's like a lot easier because addicts don't believe you anyway. And most people don't believe anything anyway. So. <laughs> um, then you got hyperglycemia. Mm. You got depression and anxiety. You can go low testosterone, which we found about a lot of addicts have that. Um, and high testosterone causes depression and anxiety. So as you can see, it's not just in, uh, uh, what's going on in your life. It's also what's going on in your body, which treatment centers don't look at. Yeah, right. It's all psychological. They throw pills at you, and, and that's it. And treatment centers, unfortunately, they're not long enough. You need anywhere from 90 to 120 days, depending on the severity of the illness. Yeah, yeah. I think most treatment centers are, what, like 30 days now? Uh, the if the they're lucky. Of, yeah, the majority of them. Yeah. I was I was fortunate enough to uh, – both of the programs that I went to were 60 day. So. Well, that's what your brain needs, a little time to heal. Yeah, absolutely. You know, look, life is always going to show up. Oh, yeah. It's always, addicts usually relapse over money and relationships. That's kind of like the standard that we do, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the big two, generally. Yeah. So, what else would you like to know? Well, I, I love that you've, like, I love the holistic approach that you've taken with recovery because I, I you know, I think that the mind, body, spirit connection is so important to the whole picture. So spirituality is the foundation of recovery. Yeah, absolutely. I'm religion, spirituality. Yeah. Learn to be kind instead of right. Do your best not to lie, cheat, or steal. All right? Help people less fortunate than you. Simple tenets of spirituality. 
Don't hurt yourself or anybody else. I mean, that's pretty easy. Yeah, it's simple. It, it, it's it's super simple, but it, it's so overlooked. You know, people just treat people like shit in general. Well, because you know, you know what it is. People don't trust people. Right. People have been hurt by a lot of people that they trusted. So now their radar is everybody is shit. Right. It's all historic wounds. Yeah. 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 For sure. So uh, I also read that you uh, you have some involvement with plant medicine. As far yeah. as addiction treatment, I work with the. Uh, I'm real fortunate, man. The, the people I work with, it's like the top of the food chain, man. I don't even know how it happened. Mm. Uh, I work with. I told you the geneticists who found the addiction. Mm. I work with uh, 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 Dr. Paul Harch. He's a pioneer in hyperbaric medicine. Mm. Okay, I work with also Dr. Deborah Mesh. I'm also one of the leading experts on plant medicine. Uh, I work with her for. I still work for her with her. For over 20 something years. We had a, a treatment center in the island of St. Kitts, a detox center. Mm. Uh, and that's where we did Ibogaine. I don't know if you're familiar with Ibogaine. Yes. Okay. Ibogaine is a plant from West Africa. It was used by the Weedy tribe. Mm. They used it as a rite of passage. Now, what happened is a guy named Howard Lutzoff, mm. who was a heroin addict, was looking for a new high and came across what Ibogaine. So he went to Africa, West Africa, and he got some Ibogaine. And this guy was doing 10, 15 bags of dope a day. Hmm. All right? He was a real good heroin addict. Yeah, yeah. That way. All right? And um, he woke up after doing Ibogaine. He woke up the next morning detoxed with no cravings. Hmm. And he said, wait a second. How can this be possible? Being a good addict and street guy, he said, I can make money with this. And he opened up a place in Panama. Hmm. Uh, and Dr. Dr. Mash, she got a hold of her. She's a neuromolecular scientist from University of Miami School of Medicine. She was the head of the Brain Bank and the Alzheimer's Foundation. Okay. So she worked with him. And then she broke away from him and started her own treatment center in St. Kitts. And that's how I started working with her. And, and I think it's incredible. Yeah. I yeah. watched, well, I treated thousands of people. With Ivan? With Ivan? With Ivan. And uh, matter of fact, she's in the process of uh, FDA trials with it. They're trying to get it here in the United States because you can't do it here in the United States. It's schedule one drug. Right. And what happens with Ibogaine, you go back into your, to put it simplistically, you go back into your childhood as an adult hmm. and you revisit all your traumas. And you have what is known as a cathartic experience, uh, a resolution of all of that stuff. So now when you look at it, you're not emotionally connected to it. You're just looking at it from an intellectual viewpoint. So you can understand it much better without that interference of the emotional state. So, and, and see what the problem is, a lot of people that are giving people Ibogaine, um, they mean well, they really want to help people. Problem is, they're not doing it in, a, in like medically, um, where you protect people medically. Right. Because if you have a, a heart problem or things like that, you could die from Ibogaine. Uh, if you're doing benzos and things like that, you can also die from Ibogaine, okay? Because it suppresses your 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 heart. You can't breathe. Uh, so what happens is the way we did it was the clients would come to me in Miami. Uh, we would put a heart monitor around them for 24 hours to see the condition of their heart, all right? Then we would give them a, a, a toxicology test and blood work to see how their body was functioning. Then uh, the doctors would do that. And then we would send them to the island of St. Kitts, and I would go with them. And then they would repeat some of it. They would do EKGs, and uh, they would do toxicology tests again. And you see, addicts, when they go to get detoxed, they always do a holdout because they're afraid they're going to be in pain. So they're hiding their stuff everywhere. <laughs> uh, you know, so since I know that, all right, so we had to tell them, listen, you, you use this stuff, you're going to die, man. Right. So, you know, we had to go into their stuff. Anyway, so what, what my job was to prepare them for their journey. And we would have them write down all the stuff that bothered them, all their traumas and all this other stuff. And uh, then they would go into... Uh, uh, the room in a hospital bed. We would put an IV in their arm 
case there's any kind of an event, put a heart monitor on them. Okay, same thing. We put eye shades on them, and we put a headset on them with music, mm-hmm. keeping them in a containment field. Then we would give them a test dose, and after 45 minutes, we see if they tolerate it, and then we would give them a full dose. Then they usually would go, with, depending if they're a fast metabolizer, slow metabolizer, mm-hmm. and how their liver was functioning, they would go anywhere from 8 to 12 hours in a dream state. Then they would come out, and my job was to help them to understand what they saw in their journey Mm -hmm. and do therapy with them. And it was amazing. Most people didn't believe that guys could come out. I mean, I'll give you an example. How about 80 milligrams of methadone? (laughs) It takes months to really, really clear up from methadone. Mm -hmm. And it takes about, I don't know, maybe about 30 days the detox, 21 days, 30 days to detox hmm. on that much methadone, 24 hours. Wow. No cravings, no yeah. minimal uh, residual. I've, I've heard about that for a long time. I've heard that Ibogaine has a like a really high efficacy for, yes. for opiate treatment. Yeah, yes. that's awesome. That, well, yeah. Not only that, you see, we call detox detox. Hmm. No, these are not detox centers. If you want to go with, if you look up the term detox, it means to detoxify, right. not put other toxins in. Yeah. That's number one. Yeah. These units are really stabilization units. Mm. They're stabilizing your blood pressure. They're stabilizing you. All right. So you can move on to the next journey. Yeah. Uh, I became the football game. They still need treatment, they still need therapy. Because you see, what people don't understand, drugs leave behind behaviors. Right. Okay? You know, if you've been, like, manipulative, slimy, and all this other shit for for 20 years, just because you stopped the drugs doesn't mean those behaviors go away. Right. So that's why you need to go to therapy. And most people say, well, 12 steps don't work. Therapy doesn't work. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. Things work. You don't work. Right. You You get out what you put in. Absolutely, like anything in life, man. Yeah, exactly. You know? and, and the bottom line is, is that, you know, I tell people all the time, look, there are no failures in life. There's only lessons, like I told you earlier. Mm-hmm. And what you dream out of those lessons is how you change your life. But don't let anybody ever, ever take away your passion. If you're passionate about something, go for it. Don't let anybody talk you out of doing what you're doing. You're doing this. You're not making a, a probably any money at all with the stuff you're doing because it's from your heart, and you want to, you know, give back probably to the planet. Yeah. Okay. And that spiritual journey, your karma that you're going to get, and your karma bank mm-hmm. is going to replace the karma you got when you were using, if you were using. Right. That's the hope, right? <laughs> huh? I said that's the hope, right? Well, you know, it's not just the hope. It's a reality. Yeah. You keep doing the next right thing, the next right thing starts to happen. That's you know, true. when people say, well, I can't make a decision. Well, no decision is a decision. But yeah, exactly. Inaction is still an action. That's right. Yeah. You know, and people talk about spirituality. That's not perfection. I'm definitely not perfect. You know, it's, 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 it's a process. It's not an event. I'm 75 years old. But everything I tell people to do, I do. I take my nutrients, 